Let's get right to the latest headlines this morning as we start on a Friday morning. Overnight, New York's stay-at-home order was extended until at least June 13th. But several regions in central and upstate New York that have met certain guidelines are being allowed to begin a phased reopening starting today. Meanwhile, the CDC has released new guidelines for reopening parts of the economy, including schools, mass transit systems, and summer camps. And today the House is set to vote on a new $3 trillion relief bill. This bill would include a second round of stimulus checks for many Americans. But President Trump has already said the bill is dead on arrival. And as we begin this morning, cases of the coronavirus are approaching one and a half million, and the death toll has climbed to nearly 87,000 people in this country. We've got a lot to get to. Let's start with the reopening of several states here in this country. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is in Syracuse, New York, one of the cities getting back to business this morning. And Gabe, as I understand it, a little bit unexpectedly. Uh, yeah, that's right, Savannah. We're about a four-hour drive from New York City, the nation's coronavirus epicenter. And today is the day that some of these businesses have been waiting for. Construction and manufacturing will be allowed to reopen. So will some retail businesses with curbside pickup. But in some places around the country, the battle over reopening is leaving more questions than answers. This morning, across Wisconsin, confusion. More businesses are reopening amid a patchwork of local health restrictions after the state Supreme Court overturned the governor's stay-at-home order. Everything is too political. People should just use good judgment. I think we all have to be careful, but being careful doesn't necessarily mean being locked up. The governor is warning a rushed reopening will lead to more deaths. Many more people could get sick and overwhelm our hospitals but not if we stay the course and stay home. Cheers! Clearly, not everyone's staying home. Some bars and restaurants are packed. After my employees haven't been paid now in two months, I had to look out for them and their families, and I had to look out for my business. Now, the CDC is releasing previously delayed guidelines for workplaces nationwide on how and when to safely reopen. Some of the recommendations promote healthy hygiene practices, intensify cleaning, disinfection, and ventilation, and check for signs and symptoms of employees daily upon arrival. At least five states are expected to start a limited reopening today, including parts of New York, 54 days after its stay-at-home order first went into effect. We're happy just to be able to be open in some semblance. Governor Andrew Cuomo warns this doesn't mean the coronavirus crisis is over. Phased reopening does not mean the problem has gone away. It means we have controlled the problem because of what we did. In South Carolina, one restaurant is getting creative, using mannequins and some seats to promote social distancing. This is a different type of news conference. While church leaders in North Carolina protest strict restrictions on indoor gatherings, in Michigan, protesters are gathering outside the state capitol again, bashing that state's stay-at-home order. At this point, the solution is starting to hurt people. That's not a solution anymore. Now, here in Syracuse, New York, the partial reopening was just announced yesterday, and all of these reopenings come amid an alarming new study about the spread of coronavirus. Researchers say that talking loudly for just one minute can leave thousands of droplets into the air that can linger for up to eight seconds, and the louder the speech, the more the droplets. Craig? All right, Gabe Gutierrez for us there in Syracuse. Gabe, thank you. Now to the stark warning delivered to Congress by a vaccine expert turned whistleblower who says the government's response to the pandemic must change or our worst days could be ahead. NBC's White House correspondent Peter Alexander has more on that. Peter, good morning to you. Hey, Craig, good morning to you. You're right. President Trump today is scheduled to deliver remarks on the race to develop a vaccine, even as that top government scientist is casting doubt on the president's timeline for a vaccine to be available. Dr. Rick Bright testifying that his warnings about supply shortages were repeatedly ignored and saying if proper steps are not taken now, the pandemic will only get worse. A dire warning from one of the country's top vaccine officials. If we fail to improve our response now based on science, I fear the pandemic will get worse and be prolonged. 
Dr. Rick Bright testifying Thursday that time is running out to contain the coronavirus. Without better planning, 2020 could be the darkest winter in modern history. Bright, who was forced out as the head of the government agency developing a COVID-19 vaccine, telling lawmakers he raised red flags about the looming pandemic months ago, accusing President Trump and senior officials at the Department of Health and Human Services of minimizing the outbreak in January and February. The best scientific guidance and advice was not being conveyed to the American public. Bright also says the Trump administration brushed off early warnings from the nation's top manufacturer of medical masks. I'll never forget the emails I received from, from Mike Bowen and indicating that we are, we are, our mask supply or N95 respiratory supply was, was completely decimated. And he said, we're in deep. President Trump's repeatedly predicted a vaccine could be ready by the end of this year, a timeline Bright disputes. I still think 12 to 18 months is an aggressive schedule, and I think it's going to take longer than that to do so. And as Bright was testifying, the president personally attacked him. He's nothing more than a, a really uh, disgruntled, unhappy person. Bright's boss, HHS Secretary Alex Azar, dismissing the scientist's allegations. Everything he's complaining about was achieved. It comes amid the president's trip to the battleground state of Pennsylvania, where he toured a medical supplies company and notably did not wear a mask while others did. And on that topic, in a new interview, Ivanka Trump is responding to criticism her father has received for not wearing a mask in public, telling USA Today, I always wear a mask when I'm with the president and everyone is instructed to do so as well, suggesting that's one of the reasons the president does not wear one. Ivanka Trump today is also touting a new food distribution program to get meat and produce from farmers and ranchers to those in need. But back to Dr. Bright's testimony. Bright warning, even when a vaccine is ready, the federal government does not have a plan to distribute it. He says the administration needs to form a strategy now to make sure a vaccine can be fairly administered to tens of millions of Americans. Craig and Savannah. All right, Peter, thank you very much. And now to that new health alert that was issued by the CDC about the mystery illness in children believed to be linked to the coronavirus. That advisory went to doctors nationwide to help them identify its signs and symptoms. NBC's Kristen Dahlgren has been following this story closely all week. Kristen, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. So this morning, doctors across the country should have this alert in hand. It's important not just so they can identify this, but also so that they can track it and begin to better understand this illness. This morning, the CDC giving doctors a critical checklist, specific criteria for a syndrome identified in a growing number of children over the last several weeks. Fever, inflammation, at least two organs impacted, and a positive test for COVID-19, antibodies, or COVID exposure four weeks before the onset of symptoms. Symptoms, which are described as similar to Kawasaki disease, include rash, red eyes or tongue, and abdominal pain. The syndrome is rare, but potentially deadly. Three children ages 5, 7, and 18 have died. The CDC alert says it's not clear if adults can develop the same type of overactive inflammatory response weeks after a COVID infection. But over 135 cases in children have now been reported across at least 19 states in Washington, D.C. The vast majority in New York, where coronavirus cases peaked about six weeks ago. Dr. Jeffrey Burns has been studying the syndrome with more than 1,000 doctors. We haven't yet been able to establish what the direct link is. He says we can expect to see multi-system inflammatory syndrome about four to six weeks after coronavirus spikes in a given community. It's not like COVID-19. The children are not actively infected uh, with the virus. That's not what we believe this is. And it's not like COVID-19 in the sense that we're still waiting treatments and studies. Four-year-old Amelia tested negative for COVID twice. But when she was rushed to the hospital in severe pain, she finally tested positive for COVID antibodies. We all have the antibodies too. My three-year-old, myself, and my husband. Amelia ended up on a ventilator, but has responded well to treatment. So we have treatments to give children with this inflammatory syndrome if they develop some of these really life-threatening complications. After 16 days in the hospital, yesterday, Amelia got to go home.
And Amelia will be home for her fifth birthday this weekend, so she's got a lot to celebrate. The takeaway for parents is this is not subtle. You will know that something is wrong with your child, and if you see those symptoms, you need to get help as soon as possible. Craig? All right, Kristen Dahlgren, and happy birthday to Amelia as well, Kristen. Thank you. We have some encouraging news this morning on the race for a vaccine. There's an experimental treatment that's being tested by scientists at Oxford University that's showing new progress this morning. Today's senior international correspondent, Keir Simmons, is in London with that part of the story. Keir, good morning. Hey, Craig, good morning. A stunning warning from a senior executive at the World Health Organization is still reverberating this morning, warning that the coronavirus may never go away. That's why this positive news from this vaccine team here in the UK, whilst another small step, is a big deal. This morning, fresh hope for a vaccine breakthrough. A single dose given to six rhesus macaque monkeys, which share a majority of their genes with humans, was found to produce antibodies as early as 14 days after vaccination. The Rocky Mountains lab that carried out the small trial releasing this new report, saying after the tests, the vaccine appeared to have prevented pneumonia and other lung problems associated with coronavirus. And the report says no sign of dangerous side effects, no evidence of immune enhanced disease. Now, scientists from the UK's Oxford University say the early indications from human trials could come in June. Hundreds of people have already been injected with the possible vaccine. And I'm doing like the tiniest little bit that I can. <laughs> the scientists behind the research telling us they're able to move fast because their vaccine has been in development for decades. The vaccine updated for today's coronavirus. We're using a vaccine type that has been in thousands of people before. There's no guarantee it will ultimately prove to be successful. Over 100 vaccines are in development around the world. And already attention is turning to how to produce enough. How many doses of vaccine do you think you can make? We are aiming to make not millions, probably not tens of millions, but ideally hundreds of millions of doses of this vaccine. President Trump has repeatedly said he thinks we will have a vaccine by the end of the year, despite reservations from some scientists on his coronavirus team. On Thursday, he went a step further, talking timeline and distribution. And I think we're going to have a vaccine by the end of the year. And I think distribution will take place almost simultaneously because we've geared up the military. One issue that, though, may delay the trials, and this is fascinating, is that because of the lockdown in places like here in the UK, there is less coronavirus, Savannah. So that means it takes longer, potentially, for people to become infected. And, of course, you cannot simply uh, deliberately infect people. All the same, Savannah, they are planning to ramp up manufacturing of these vaccines even before the positive results, just so they're ready, Savannah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good to get a little good news this morning. Kara, thank you. We've got developments in the Ahmad Arbery case in Georgia to tell you about this morning. The father and son charged with his murder are arguing there is more to the story than people know. NBC's Blaine Alexander joins us from Atlanta with the latest on this. Blaine, good morning. Well, Savannah, good morning to you. The two attorneys for Travis McMichael say that they have spoken with their client and with the prosecutor, and they say they know that the emotions around this case are very high. Now, they wouldn't give details about the defense, but they promised that more information would come out in court. This morning, attorneys for Travis McMichael say they are learning more about what happened before and after this video showing the final moments of Ahmaud Arbery's life. All of the facts will come out. That's the purpose of a trial. Travis and his father, Gregory McMichael, are both in jail charged with Arbery's murder. Father and son have separate legal teams. Attorneys for the senior McMichael say in a statement, the full story will tell the truth about this case. Video of that February shooting has sparked nationwide outrage. Arbery's family says the 25-year-old was just out for a jog unarmed. According to the police report, Gregory McMichael told police he and son Travis grabbed their guns and followed Arbery because they thought he was a burglary suspect. McMichael told police Travis fired when Arbery violently attacked and the two started fighting over the shotgun. Travis has a presumption of innocence. That presumption of innocence follows him from now throughout the course of this trial until and unless a jury decides that he is not innocent. 
We wish that Travis and Gregory McMichael would have afforded that same presumption of innocence to Ahmaud Arbery, uh, who was murdered without a trial, uh, without any real evidence that he had committed a crime at all. Now, attorneys for Arbery's family want to find the person who wrote this anonymous handwritten note left at a memorial. It reads, Ahmad, I am so sorry. I should have stopped them. So this is not a person who just feels bad about what happened in general. This is a person who at least felt like they had power to prevent this, that they had some sort of foreknowledge about what was going on. Investigators say they know who wrote the note and that person is not connected to the investigation in any way and was just expressing their condolences. And today we will also hear from the attorneys for Gregory McMichael in a separate news conference. Now, both legal teams say that they hope to have their clients in court in the coming weeks where they will request that they be released on bond. Savannah. All right, Blaine Alexander, thank you very much. It's 18 minutes after the hour. Craig, we'll send it to you. All right, SG, here's something that should put a smile on your face on this Friday morning. There were some, some shoppers at a grocery store in Nashville who got quite the welcome surprise this week. When it was time to check out and pay, they found out someone had already covered their bill. Not just anyone, though. No, no. It was Los Angeles Dodgers outfielder Mookie Betts, the four-time All-Star and Nashville native. He bought groceries for several shoppers at a Kroger store there, but his act of kindness didn't stop there. Vets also threw a pizza party for all the store employees, those grocery store workers who've become so essential over the past few months, Savannah. I love, oh, I love that. Say it with pizza. You know I'm a big believer. <laughs> right. It's International Pizza Night tonight, Friday. Al, what you got, what you got your eye on? Well, we've got severe weather to talk about, and we're also watching the tropics. Take a look down in Florida. We're watching this area that we told you about yesterday. Well, now the National Hurricane Center has given this a 80% chance of development in the next several days. It's Invest Area 90L, and so we'll be watching it. Whatever happens, it's going to cause rough surf, rift currents into next week along the southeastern Atlantic coast. Heavy rain through Saturday down through Florida. Now, we're also talking about severe Severe weather today, starting in the Northeast, 34 million people at risk, damaging winds, hail, tornadoes. This is the kind of situation you would see in July in the Northeast, not in mid-May. And back through Texas, 18 million people at risk for damaging winds, hail, possibility of tornadoes, areas of heavy rain, second day in a row in the Gulf today. Then as we move into tomorrow, a storm will develop along these fronts, flash flooding likely in Texas. And in the Northeast, we're going to be looking at severe storms as well. Then Sunday, it's a very active pattern. Strong storms into the Ohio River Valley, heavy rain from Detroit, Michigan to Buffalo, New York. And this is going to continue right on into next week. And in fact, through Sunday, upwards of five inches of rain down through southeastern Texas. We expect to see more heavy rain making its way into the northeast.